Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a different today, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more teaching than I am preaching today. So if you have your copy of God's Word, open it to Mark chapter number 4. We've been in the series called Faith and Blessing. We've been looking at the life of Abraham, and we've done that for, what, about three months now? And, and here those two go together. Faith is us seeing God uh, through, through circumstances and trusting God when everything else would tell us not to. It's holding on to the promise and the goodness of God. It's, it's knowing those things, believing those things, trusting those things, and living those things. And if we could just let God be God, if we could just position ourselves in a place where when he says, this is what we're supposed to do, we say, yes, sir. And, and, and seek to do it to honor him and to bring glory unto him. Blessings flow from that. He is the God of all creation. He is the God with no beginning, and praise God, and no end. He's not some miser. He's not some mad old uh, God who's just looking around grumbling and snarling. That's not who God is. God desires to do exceedingly abundantly more. That's the kind of God he is. More than we could ask, more than we can even think, God wants to do so much more for, the, for us than that. He has prepared so much more for us than that. But here's the thing that we need to, to know and to understand. As we come to God, as we believe, as we trust, as we allow, right? As we take God at his word and, and, and begin to live those things and follow those things. That's what it means to be a disciple. As we begin to obey those things and let those things be the, the precepts and principles of our life, then, then God opens up the bounty of his nature and his goodness and desires to pour them out upon us. Sometimes we look at circumstances and we grumble. But the Word of God tells us that all things work together for good. All things. Right? And all means all, and that's all all means. That's what I heard Adrian Rogers say one time. Amen? It, it, it's all all things can work together for good. Those who love God who, to those who are the called according to his purpose. What we've got to do is position ourselves in the place that God wants us to look at. Now, in Mark chapter 4, there is a principle here that I believe is one of the great fabrics in all of the Word of God. And I believe it will affect everything we do. Are y'all good with that? Everything that we seek to do, as we seek to listen... As we seek to obey, as we seek to see God and see the world, as we seek to, to see God's work in the world and what part we play in it, there's a principle here that is taught, and um, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of the scripture that adds up to this principle just to put it in context. We never want to take anything out of context, amen? Amen. But you're going to see the principle as Jesus is trying to describe something, and then he states the principle, and we're going to look at a, a few different passages of Scripture. And I, I, I want to uh, pray real quick, even before we look at this, so that we can hear from God. Amen? Let's just pray. Father God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for all the things that you have done. I thank you for your people, the people that you have called, the people who have said yes to you, and have a life with you and a relationship with you. And Lord, uh, as you have a love relationship with us, we seek to have that same love relationship with you. And Lord, you have done so much for us. Time could not permit us to, to describe all the, the blessings, thousands of things that you do for us that we do not see, thousands of the things that you keep from happening to us because of your loving hand. We're just grateful that you're on the throne and that you choose to love us. And Lord, I pray that we would choose to love you. So Lord, help us to see your scripture. Help it become real. Take the, take the simplicity of what it is and let it come alive in our life. In Jesus' name, the name that is above all names, I pray. Amen. Mark chapter 4, let's begin in verse number 21. You there say amen. And he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set up on a lampstand? Why do you have light? You have light not to hide it, but to let the light shine. That's not the precept. Verse 22. For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, 
nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should all come to light. I have so much for you. I have so much that I want to do, say to you, so much that I want to tell you, so much that I want to encourage you. And, and that's the purpose of light. We don't take light and hide it, but take the light, accept the light, let it shine. Let it do the work that I've called it to do. Light dispels darkness. So let the light do what the light is called to do. And then he says in verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. That means some will have ears and will hear and say yes and obey and make it part of the light. Some will not. So he is encouraging us to listen. Not just listening with our ears, but listening with our heart. If anyone has ears to hear, something amazing and good is going to happen. Hear these things. Know these things. Believe these things. Live these things. Now here it comes. Verse number 24. And he said to them, take heed, be careful, watch out. There's this big neon sign that says, be careful what you hear. Here's the statement. With the, with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. With the same standard, in the same way, in the same amount, in the same fashion that you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. So here he's saying there's a capacity here. If you're hearing and your heart is open and you're seeking and you want to take this, in this particular occasion, he's talking about light. He's talking about his truth. He's talking about our influence. He's talking about our walk in this world. If you'll be so open, God can do amazing things, mighty things, wonderful things, in the same amount, in the same way that you allow God to work. Now, y'all look up here. How many of y'all know what a thimble is? I hope we haven't gotten so fancy in our culture that we have lost certain names and certain meanings. A thimble, amen? A little bit thimble. How many of you know what a five-gallon bucket is? Well, amen. We, we can relate to a five-gallon bucket. Let's say an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Y'all got, got it? Pretty big, isn't it? What about a Grand Canyon with a, a river of life flowing through it? How many of y'all been to the Grand Canyon? Seen pictures of it. It's big. We went on vacation there when I was a little kid. We drove all the way across the United States. We drove up to it. We got out, looked at it, and Dad said, okay, let's go. <laughs> that was a vacation with my dad. We went through the painted desert and watched it as we drove by, you know. It was just one of those things that he did. But you've seen it, all the miles across, how deep it is, and that, that river that flows through it, and, and what time has done, how vast. We got a thimble, we got a five-gallon bucket, we got a swimming pool, and we've got a Grand Canyon of possibilities of life. I just wonder how much faith, how much light. I wonder... The amount that you bring in, it will be brought to you. The amount that you receive, you can use and give. The amount that comes to you that you accept will flow through. Will flow through. You know, life is, we're busy and life is difficult and we've got our life and we've got what we do and, you know, Plenty of times, let's talk about the truth here, the influence of, of Scripture, the light of God's blessings and his, his glory. How many times do we, how many of you are sermon deaf? You know what I mean by that? I mean, you come and you hear a sermon and you say, oh, that was a good word. You go to lunch and you forget it all. What is it about Sunday lunch and we just never can get any more of it? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Hey, sometimes it happens to me and I preach the sermon, Right? I mean, we don't need another sermon, but we desperately need the Word of God. And in the same capacity that we're open to it, God can use it in our life. So what, what good is it if we come and all we, all we bring to God is a thimble? 
for God to fill. I mean, let's use the illustration of water. I mean, it may quench your thirst for five minutes. A five-gallon bucket may help a day or two. A swimming pool may last a couple weeks, maybe a month, I don't know. But a Grand Canyon could take you for generations. And the influence could live beyond you. But yet, to the capacity that we open ourselves up, that's the capacity that God will use to fill. To the, to the measure that we're open, to the measure that we will accept, to the measure that we allow, God wants to do amazing and mighty things. So what can God's Word do? Exactly what we allow God to do it. Take your Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter number 7. You may know where I'm headed with this. Jesus uses this same illustration again in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter number 7. You there? Say amen. I told you I'm just going to do some teaching here. Let's, let's listen to the Word of God. Let, listen to the Holy Spirit as I preach. Judge not. Stop it. Quit it. Don't do it. Y'all look up here again. Every one of us judge. Don't you think for a skinny second that you don't judge? We all judge. You may judge thimbleful. You may judge bucketful. You may judge Grand Canyon full. Right? But he says it's not good. It's not right. We need to stop it. He says, judge not that you be not judged. Hold on. If you do not judge, you will not be judged. Let's keep going. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. In the same way that you judge someone else, that same manner, you're going to allow yourself to be judged. Here's the phrase. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If you come with a bucket full of judgment, you're going to get a bucket full of judgment back. I'm going to talk more about this in just a moment. It's going to be worse. Come on. If you look at somebody and you look down upon them and you condemn them and you say they shouldn't have done that and you, you just look at their life and you just say how terrible it is because of such and such, be careful. You've just, you have just opened the door for judgment to come upon you. I have two very good friends of mine, very close friends of mine, ones that I've worked with and I've, I, I've done great things. You know, God's just been gracious and glorious. But there was an incident that happened and, and one was judging the other. And I got brought into this. And not only was he judging, he was condemning. And the one that had really not done anything, and what he had done, maybe uh, his motive was not as perfect as it, or maybe he didn't uh, do something as quickly as he was supposed to. But he had, in, in Brian's vernacular, he had apologized and he was seeking reconciliation. He was seeking the right thing. He was wanting God's glory to happen in it. But this other person over there just wouldn't let it go and just kept going and kept going and kept going after him and kept going after him. But you see, I know more to the story because months before I had spoken with that other person and he had done something in his life and I'd ask him the question, how in the world did you have time to do all the things that you had done? And he had explained it and said, well, I, I, I know I shouldn't have and, and I, I know I should have got permission and I really just, just uh I just did it anyway, and really what he was doing was he was doing something much worse than what he was accusing the other friend of, but in his vernacular, in his way of understanding, what he was doing wasn't that bad, but he was just condemning this other person, and the one thing that I knew was this, God's still on the throne, and God knows not every act and every intent and every motive of every heart, say Amen. He knows what we do and he knows <clears throat> why we do what we do. And what that person was doing was they were not being Christ-like. They were judging, but what they didn't realize was they were opening themselves up. God's saying, if you're going to judge somebody like that, judge on. But it's coming back in the same manner. All right? Now, there are things that are wrong. There are things that are wrong. Abortion is wrong. Y'all listening? 
And I'm not judging those person. I'm looking at that and saying that's wrong. If you want to be judged by the same standard that you judge someone else, judge your own. Right? But be careful. Because you see, Jesus talked about you're so quick to take a, a, the splinter out of your brother's eye, but you got this great big plank, this log in your own eye. So if you're going to judge, you're going to be judged by the same standard. Here's the point that I want you to get. We're going to move forward. He is saying the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You're going to find this precept, this principle, all the way through Scripture. Jesus puts it out there for us. If you're going to open yourself up to this, if you're going to open yourself up in faith, God can bless in a great and a mighty way. If you're going to open yourself up to sin, we're going to talk more about this, expect more sin in return. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 6. You there? Say amen. Look at verse 37. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. That's his words. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You notice the concept? Now look in verse 38. Give. This is a verb. This is an action word. He is saying because of the blessings that God has put upon you, because you are a good steward of what God has given you, give. And it will be given to you. Oh, he, puts, he puts parameters on this. So many times that, that when we're preaching, this is all about tithing and giving. But really, it's a principle of God. If you will open yourself up, if you will trust in God, if you will believe in God, if you will just allow God to be God, and, and, and the things that come from God, you are a steward of. So as God is given to you, you give. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will it be put into your bosom? I, I'm saying, he, he is saying, don't give like a thimble. Don't even give like a five-gallon bucket. Give much bigger than yourself. Allow yourself to be a, a something, a tool in God's hands that God will pour it in you, but pour it through you so that you can be a blessing to others. Look at the end of verse 38. Are you there? For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Are y'all catching on to this? He says, look, in the same way that you're going to give, it will be given. In the same way that you love, you will receive love. Look what he says in verse number 35. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Now look, you may have never declared war on that person, but something may have come up where they have declared war on you. You're still in a battle. When I was a kid, my dad taught me something that I never forgot. He said, son, don't you ever start a fight. If you start a fight, can I, I need to be very careful how I say this. I won't say it the way my dad said it. He said, there will be a part of you that will be so shining and so warm that you won't want to sit down with them for quite a while. Y'all get the general hint of what I'm talking about? Don't you ever start a fight. But then he went on to say this. I don't even think he breathed in between sentences. He said, but if I ever hear that you backed away from a fight, you're going to get it twice. And that vernacular, that way of thinking it has gone through. How dare they say that about me? How dare they do that to me? Well, I tell you what, and we feel like we have the right. Come on now. We feel like not only we have the right, we have the responsibility that if they dish it out to us, man, we better, we have full free way. We can just dish it out to them. The problem with that is that not the way Jesus taught us. He says agape. He says cherish. He says, find value in your enemy. Now, it, I love my wife. Amen? Oh, that would have been a good time. I got Jack back there. Amen to me. I love my wife. She is precious to me. I value her. I cherish her. And I seek to give to her out of that relationship. I will do for her. 
He's using the exact same word to tell us that we are to come in the same manner to our enemies, to those people who spitefully use you. Get to the end of the Beatitudes when you are persecuted. How are you supposed to act back? This is life-changing. Then he throws this in. Uh, he, he throws the principle in again when he talks about giving. In the same way that you give, you will be given. In the same measure you use. In the same measure you love, folks. Let me just read. Love your enemies. Do good. Do good. He doesn't just say, just ignore them and don't talk to them. He says, do good for them. He brings in this word, <laughs> lend. But then he even adds to that and says, uh, and hoping for nothing in return. We're not talking about lending that tool that you've never used before and you don't want to ever use again. Amen. Right? Give of your best. And by the way, when you give it, don't even expect to get anything back. That's the way he's telling us to treat people. And your reward will be great and you will be, you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. And if Jesus is, unkind, is, is kind, if Jesus is kind to the unthankful and evil, he is calling us to do it in the same measure. Don't you give a thimble full of kindness when he's given a Grand Canyon with a river flowing through it. If you are grateful for the grace of God, and we should be, when God bestows upon us what we do not deserve, we cannot repay, we are just the, the, the recipients of his bounty. If you have received grace, give grace. If you have not received what you do deserve, which is the mercy of God, God did not punish you when you deserved punishment. God did not send you to a sinner's hell, the devil's hell, but he made a place for you in a place called heaven because you believed in him. Then you do the same for others. In the same measure that you have received from Christ, give to others. Oh, it's quiet in this place. It's quiet in this place. The principle of sowing and reaping is all the way through Scripture. When we sow seeds, whether it's seeds of love, seeds of encouragement, seeds of kindness, seeds of witnessing, seeds of giving, seeds of forgiving. Come on, forgiving. In the same way, when you forgive, you open up the jail cell and receive the glory of forgiveness. In the same way, when you scatter seeds, when you sow seeds, you always reap more than what you sowed. When you trust God and believe, and it doesn't make sense, but you just choose to be obedient and to live the life that he wants you to, in the same respect, God will give back. I love the scripture that talks about the scattering of seed that fell on the good soil, the good heart. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold. My God says maybe even 100-fold. You love in one seed, he'll love back in 100. Come on now. Y'all believe that? This is the principle that's coming to us. You judge, then you've just tied the hands of a gracious, loving God. You see, when, when God describes his nature, his nature does not change. He is not a God who loves when he's in a good mood and hates when he's in a bad mood. He is always love, but it's how we come to it and receive it. God always, all things work together for good. Is that not what the word says? To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose? I mean, it's there for us. I'm not taking this out of context, folks. Sowing and reaping. Grace and mercy. Love and giving. The opportunity's there. 
The opportunity's there. The world teaches something totally different. The world teaches to be selfish. The world teaches to get your own. The world is now teaching that the world owes you something. And you need to get your part now. The world is teaching that the meekness of Christ is weakness. When the word means strength under control. In the day in which Jesus is sharing this, love of an enemy was not even considered. Kings were praised for their pride. Kings were, were praised in how they would, to, uh, to, with, a, with a, a thumb, you could live or die. And yet we have the picture in Scripture of Jesus before he going, went to the cross Pray for us. Weeping. Not wanting to go to it. Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will. Thy will be done. Come on now. What he did for us on the cross of Calvary is getting paid back. I can't even tell you how many times. I almost said hundredfold, but gosh, a hundred trillion fold. A bounteous. Everything that he has done, that he's called us to receive, that he wants us to be a part of. I think one of the greatest things is just the simple childlike faith where we come to God and say, Sir, it's not natural. The world doesn't teach us this. But Lord, you've changed me and I belong to you. And Lord, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Lord, no matter what they do to me, help me be loving. <laughs> help me be giving. Lord, may I never, well, I know I'm going to be judgmental, but Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, convict me of it quickly where I can get it out of my strength into your strength. I will quickly repent. Oh, what God could do. Oh, what God could do. What could he do in our lives? You see, out of the light shines the greatest in a dark time. And my goodness, it seems pretty dark today. I began by saying we're just going to do a little teaching. And when we looked at Mark chapter 4, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I don't have a gauge up here. Those of you who are watching online, I can't look into your living room. I can't see through your computer. I don't know who's having heartburn today because of all the things that have been done to them. I just want you to know God knows, God loves, God wants to bless. The Lord that I know has been so very gracious and loving and kind to me. So very gracious. What he could do if we would just allow him. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you for being the kind of God that you are. We never have to worry about where you stand on an issue. You're always faithful. You're always there. You're always loving. You're always kind. And Lord, we're not. But I pray, Lord, that you would, you've already forgiven us. Lord, just continue to work with us. I know you look past our faults, but Lord, teach us to walk by faith. Teach us what it means, not just to say we trust you, but to live it. Father, do an Ephesians 3.20 work in our midst. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think, all we could ask or think, oh God, we need you. Oh, we need you. Father, thank you for 
making it possible for us to hear you, Holy Spirit, and for you to do a divine work in our lives. May we agree with John the Baptist, Lord, you must increase, we must decrease. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.